All right, so here we go. I'll start out just because I'm a China guy. I'm going to talk about some of the other things that are going on here today. Today, this is going to be about the Chinese economy, but we also have a number of other China panels. Uh, we got Andy Shea, the keynote at lunch, who is uh, always smart on China, always provocative, a very independent thinker. We got Jeffrey Wasserstein and uh, Chu Dong Mei on One Belt, One Road. Jeffrey is one of the most prolific uh, writers on China these days uh, among academics. Uh, Clay Chandler is moderating the, the China Dream. Um, and then we got Matthew Spencer on China US. So it's quite a, uh, uh, there's a lot going on in China uh, today. And let's start out talking about the economy. Um, my colleagues here probably need no introduction. Arthur Krober, I've known him for, I don't know, 20 years or something like that. Arthur is a former journalist turned self-trained economist, so actually what he writes about the economy you can understand. Um, he has just finished um, a great book on the Chinese economy that I read this summer, and I've been in China 30 years, and I learned a lot from, from Arthur's book. He's always very clear-minded and an independent thinker. Andrew Pan um, came to the U.S. as the uh, representative of the Shenzhen um, trade government, and you were the rep here on doing business development, and now you're head of strategy and business development for East West Bank. Charlene Barsevsky, I've known her for many, many years. I watched Charlene come into China in the 90s as USTR doing um, 301s, um, trade actions on IPR and on market access. Um, very key on opening up uh, the China market. Uh, I watched her and Long Yong too go through many years of negotiations on WTO. Um, she's the one that brought the concept of win-win to China. Um, and now she's with Wilmer Hale. She's a senior um, international partner and on a number of uh, boards, including ELC, Estee Lauder, and um, Intel, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to open up by uh, provoking things a little bit. Um, I look at China today. I've lived in China since 1990, and I'm completely confused on where the economy is going. We're supposed to be looking forward, according to Terry, so um, um, I hope we can get some help from our... Uh, from our, my colleagues here. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the debt, stalled reforms, continued support for inefficient SOEs, uh, an ideology that's kind of uh, reaching backwards, um, overcapacity, I think what Arthur called Lenin, Len, Leninist capitalism in his book. Um, but then we have the entrepreneurs, the maker movement, venture capital, uh, China moving up the manufacturing scale with manufacturing 2025, global expansion. So how do I look at China? On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I think China's going to collapse. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I think it's going to take over the world. On Sunday, I try not to think about it. <laughs> um, now, uh, you know, I watched Deng's Nanshun, um, you know, reignite the Chinese economy in 1992. And as I said, I've watched all the trade negotiations with Ambassador Barshevsky. And um, now, you know, where the heck are we headed? Well, um, if you look at, at the, the progression of things, I think the, the turning point was a great, um, uh, fin the great financial crisis, global financial crisis, when China kind of looked around, so maybe our system is better, and Wall Street lost its allure. Um, then indigenous innovation came in, um, where you re-innovate and you co-innovate and you master technologies of your foreign partners and you go out around the world and beat them. Uh, strategic emerging industries was more, well, let's see if we can go for the industries that people, other companies are not leading in yet. And now we've got China Manufacturing 2025. And this is all Xi Jinping's um, um, nomenclature on this is that China is now at the catch up and overtake stage. It's very much, I look at the Chinese system is a bit like the U.S. Um, during World War II with the War Production Board, where um, after Pearl Harbor, you know, the industrialists, the bankers, it was all one system to fight that war. Well, that's the way China is today, and it's not to fight a war, it's to make China um, rich and powerful again. And so whether it's PLA hackers, or it's Mofcom, or it's whatever part of China, uh, even private companies, um, they all have, um, they're all kind of tied into one system that is aimed at making China move up in the world, and I think it's been working pretty well in, in some regards. Um, I guess if I was to, if you'd ask me what I, I think needs to change, 
Um, I recently was in the strategic and economic dialogue. I was invited to the CEO dialogue with uh, six Chinese and six American executives to talk to, you know, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Liu, uh, Wang Yang, Yang Jiechi, Lo Jiwei, very senior people. And what was interesting is the Chinese um, CEOs, their complaints about the difficulties they have in doing business in America were very similar to what we're, we've been saying and hearing many years in China when we talk to Chinese officials. But the, you know, if you look at the JCCT and the, the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade uh, done by Commerce and you look at the Strategic and Economic Dialogue, there's 400, 400 people from the U.S. that come for the Strategic and Economic Dialogue to China this year, or, and you know, before that, the Chinese going to Washington. And uh, the, I think the economists called it the Dialogue of the Deaf, where it's now uh, people just talking past each other, scrambling to have happy outcomes, um, at least in the paperwork that comes out, and there's hundreds of positive messages, but not a lot is getting done. Um, and we had a conference in Washington in May uh, at the U.S. Chamber, we were talking about this, and Ambassador Barshevsky said, well, that's how they control us. Because what has happened is, China's very smart. They've realized how much we like process and, and systems, so our bureaucrats are very busy with all these processes of JCCT and SNED, and not a lot gets done. Um, my, my advice would be to, um, for the next president, God help us, um, for the next president to um, suspend both of those. Suspend the SNED, suspend the JCCT, and tell and go to. If China wants a great power relationship, good. Let's have a two-day president-to-president Sunnylands meeting every year, alternating countries, two full days where it's structured. There has to be outcomes, and then you reconstitute JCCT and SNED to implement and and carry things out. Because right now, I sat in this room. Uh, for the strategic and economic dialogue with the CEOs. And I could tell people were just not really all that interested or engaged. They're kind of going through the motions, um, both among the Chinese and the US, because it's just kind of things of, the, 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 the system doesn't work. And just one other, one other thing I'd like to bring up is, um, really the souring of the, of the foreign business community on China and the difficulties they're facing. It's, you know, they're looking, they're feeling like they're facing a bit of reform and closing. And we're hearing more and more the word reciprocity. If you can't do it in China, why should China do it outside? If you can't invest it in China, why should China invest outside? And um, that, that's going to be very difficult to implement, but it's also going to cause great economic stress. The conversation has to change. So I think with, with uh, those provocations, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to the smart people in the room here. Arthur. Um, in your book, you talk about uh, you know, good and bad. You've always had a, fairly, a very rational view of China. But um, the third plenum reforms, I mean, the third plenum reforms were very, very, uh, um, quite comprehensive. They're from the China 20, a lot of it from the China 2030 report. Um, but they're not being implemented. What's going on and where do you think that's heading? Right, well, I guess I would, I would frame my response to that question uh, by talking about First of all, what I think is the underlying challenge uh, that the Chinese economy now faces, and then what are the um, essentially political constraints on, on meeting that challenge. So the challenge uh, is essentially China has had a very good run over many, many years uh, in what I would call the capital mobilization stage of growth. And I, I think, Jim, your analogy to the War Production Board in the, in the United States is, is very apt. Um, in that regard because there was this essentially massive construction project for the last 35 years where you had to build the infrastructure and the basic industries and and the housing and and the related components of a modern industrial society and you can grow for a very at a very high rate for a very long time simply by increasing the amount of investment uh, that you do and the chinese uh, system has proved very effective at that um, the problem is that you ultimately you get to the end of that kind of mobilization stage of growth. You've built more or less the infrastructure that you need. And then your growth has to come almost entirely from productivity gains, um, as economists would put it. Or another way of thinking about it is you need to focus not so much on installing new assets, but you need to focus more on maximizing the return on the assets that you already have in place. So your, your 
goal shifts from mobilization to efficiency. And the tools that you need uh, for each of these phases of growth are very, very different. Uh, so what we've already seen is that there's been a significant slowdown in the Chinese growth rate from 10, 12 percent a few years ago to maybe around 6 percent today. There's probably some more sm slowdown in, in future. That's, I think, a natural consequence of this phase of growth. Um, uh, but we've also seen that the growth uh, the, uh, uh, over the last several years has been su supported not by increasing returns to capital, increasing efficiency, but simply by uh, a huge increase in debt and leverage. So we've had seen debt go from 150% of GDP um, uh, in 2008 to 250% today, and it, and it keeps climbing. So clearly, uh, the, the government is focused on growth. They're trying to get it, but they're not getting it from where they should get it, namely productivity increases, so they're getting it from increased leverage. Um, and as, as you mentioned, the third plenum reforms that were announced in the, uh, in the fall of 2013 seemed to address the key issues um, uh, that were important in shifting the focus of the economy away from this uh, build, uh, building mode to a more efficiency-oriented mode. There was a lot of talk about streamlining state-owned enterprises, increasing roles of the market, deregulation, and so forth. Um, so there's clearly within the system, there are a lot of people who understand quite lucidly what needs to be done and have a pretty good uh, set of ideas for how you move to the next stage. The problem uh, is, uh, I think, at root political, um, that if you look at the history, the, the conundrum that has always, uh, I think, puzzled people from outside, particularly from the United States, coming to China since the early 1980s was, how can you have this dynamic, uh, almost Wild West, sort of entrepreneurial capitalist economy emerging under this uh, very old-fashioned authoritarian Leninist one-party state? And a lot of people have made the argument that this is a fundamentally unstable combination, it can't last, and sooner or later, one of these things is gonna have to give way. Either the political system will have to uh, reform dramatically or even collapse, or the economy will stagnate. And for 35 years, those predictions have been dead wrong and they continue to look uh, wrong today. Now, I think the, the, the way to understand why those predictions have been wrong is to recognize that the Communist Party has, a pretty, has historically had a pretty sophisticated understanding of what it needs to do to maintain its monopoly on power in the long run. And they clearly understood uh, that economic vitality was a key part of their uh, control system and their legitimacy system. And that uh, lesson, I think, was reinforced by the collapse of the Soviet Union, which they've analyzed ad nauseum. Uh, and one of the key conclusions of those analyses is that the Soviet Union collapsed because it had a stagnant economy. So at various points in the past, the leadership, I think, has been very willing, um, when push comes to shove, to make certain tactical trade-offs from its, what I would call its control agenda for political control, they're willing to sacrifice uh, bits and pieces of their control in order to get economic growth uh, because they recognize that in the long run, the control agenda is supported by the growth agenda. I think the problem that we see today is it, it seems like the control agenda has won out um, and that Xi Jinping is, for whatever reason, obsessed with maximizing his control within the Communist Party, maximizing the Communist Party's control over uh, all aspects of society, and there seems to be no willingness to make the kinds of tactical, growth-friendly trade-offs that have been characteristic in the past. And I think that explains why we've seen the slowness to implement this agenda, and I think it raises some pretty interesting questions about you know, where exactly China's gonna go economically over the next decade if they can't get their minds around lightening up a little bit on control in order to deregulate and get more growth. I'm going to turn to Charlene now, and I'll come back to you, Andrew, on outward investment. But I want to kind of, you know, you, you, um, you actually were doing negotiations in the day of, um, I remember when you, you threatened to, uh, you were going to get on an airplane and leave Beijing because the WTO uh, negotiations reached a stalemate. Long Yong Tu went over the head of his boss and called Zhu Rongji. Zhu Rongji actually came to Mofcom, or maybe it was Moftech at that point, I forget, um, and, and finished the negotiations with you. Um, of course, never happened today. 
Uh, how have you seen the politics evolve in, in you know, you've, you've kind of been through the whole scheme here, and now as an attorney and also as a member of a board of companies that have big investments in China and a lot of business, um, where do you see this evolving? Because it's, you know, when she when came in, we were, you know, this guy, well, he's going to be a reformer, and then it's, well, he's cracking down, and then he's going to pivot and reform, and now people go, uh, who knows what the hell's going on? So what's your view? I have just, Charlene's got a cold, so uh, her voice isn't strong, but we'll give it a shot here. Sorry about that. Uh, so if you look back in the WTO days, um, the U.S. took the position that, first of all, we were in a unique period of time with a leader like Zhu Runji, uh, who understood that the reforms of Deng Xiaoping were insufficient, too shallow, not sophisticated, not broad-based, and that China had a window of opportunity which it needed to take advantage of. And the U.S. saw Zhu as a leader in that regard. Um, uh, and, of course, you're dealing with the world's largest country, a nuclear power, the world's largest standing army, even still, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, and critical to the stability of Asia, lest China, at that time, implode because its economy was still uh, quite backward. So the U.S. took the position that in order to ensure a more stable region, and in order to ensure a basis for bilateral relations that would be solid and enduring, uh, we ought to uh, see if we can get China to push its reforms toward Western economic norms, which is the WTO. It's so Western economic based, Western economic norms, at a point at which China was sufficiently pliable and Zhu Ranji was sufficiently visionary. So that's what we did. In the early years, uh, reform implementation went along quite well. Very few complaints. But what happened subsequent, and this matches what was just talked about, is that Zhu Ranji, uh, uh, Jiang Zemin left, Hu Jintao comes in. Reforms proceeded, but began to slow. And by the second five years of Hu's term, there was almost nothing going on. But what you did see was increasing talk and a fleshing out of indigenous innovation. Because even Hu Jintao saw or felt that multinationals controlled too much of what was China's wealth. That all the value add was being sucked out and China was a low end manufacturer moving up the value chain, but within a very narrow bound. And Hu Jintao at that time began saying, you know, we don't want to miss the next industrial revolution like we missed the last one, which of course they did, uh, and we don't want multinationals to dominate again. Xi Jinping comes in, and of course reform stopped. I agree, third, par third party plen plenum looked great, just stopped because he prioritized control over growth, and he continues to prioritize control over growth. And I think there's a question mark as to what will happen in his second five-year term beginning uh, next uh, October. Uh, and so, uh, and at the same time, of course, China has become much more muscular, much more assertive, and very regressive within its home market. So initially, in the Zhu Ranji and even early Hu Jintao era, and through most of Hu Jintao's era, reform was linked with opening. That hasn't been the case now. Reform is reform, further opening, no. What you see is a backward move in the market to shift the locus of economic growth from multinationals to indigenous Chinese companies. How is that done? Through a spate of policy measures designed specifically to favor homegrown enterprises, whether national champions uh, or others. 
And that growth is coming out of multinationals who are increasingly restricted, being forced to go back to the old you must partner days, you must join venture days, and whose scope for action within the market is substantially circumscribed. The industries that are most affected are those with high IP content and those that are information communications related. So the tech industry, content industry, entertainment industry, uh, hardware makers, software makers have been impacted most of all, and this will continue. I see no let up in this trend to basically move the locus of technology development um, uh, and growth from the West to China. That's also the cyber espionage aspect, which is extremely severe and remains severe today, despite agreements that have been reached. But it impacts other industries as well, biotech, pharmaceuticals, uh, advanced manufacturing, uh, so on and uh, so forth. What China has determined are strategic industries that most especially need to be within the control and domain of Chinese companies, not foreign companies. So Jim alluded to disaffection among the business community. The numbers are very startling. Only a quarter of US companies are still fully confident in their future prospects in China. 70% of US companies say that the Chinese regulatory environment and policies are the single most important factors that bear on an extremely negative view of China. And I think the most startling is that half of all companies believe they have received, quote, no benefit whatsoever from China's reforms. Again, because many of these reforms aren't directed, aren't directed toward the market as a whole. They are directed to encourage the competitive strength of indigenous Chinese companies. Well, this actually has, I think very strong um, effect on U.S.-China relations. We heard the admiral last night on the military and geopolitical situation, but the, uh, you know I, I was chairman of AmCham back in the 90s, and like many have gone to Capitol Hill year after year on uh, uh, discussions with China and with the administration. And I can tell you the people that um, the, the last um, time we went in May. Um, it was, you know, the people on the delegation, some of it in China 30 years, and they're people that were pushing for MFN, WTO, there was not a positive word said. Um, very negative view on China from the business community, but they won't say it out in front of China, they say it in closed doors. Um, what's interesting is you'll have uh, uh, companies now go into uh, Treasury or USTR, and they'll say, I got this problem, I got that problem, it violates this agreement, it does that. And then uh, the government says, what would you like us to do? And the companies say nothing, because they're scared of China. You know, you've got, you've got um, on one hand, you have, a, you know, if you look at the party, it's a combination of General Electric, where it's very quality people moving to ever-increasing um, job responsibility, well-educated. On the other hand, there's this whole kind of, um, you know, hard-nosed, um, do it, you know, do it we say or you're, you're going to face retribution. And the, the sad part of that, it was the business community that was holding the relationship together. And if that phrase, things could really um, get off kilter. I want to turn to a little bit more positive here. Andrew, um, Shenzhen is so cool. I mean, um, I used to go to Shenzhen when it was just, you know, mud puddles in old factories. You go down there now, if I was 22 years old, I'd go to Shenzhen. You got all these companies there that are innovating. It's got the best electronic supply chain. I mean, Beijing does software and does internet stuff. Um, Shenzhen is uh, manufacturing for technology, and there's all kinds of innovation and, and incubators, and actually some of the companies down there now don't put Chinese on their business cards. DJI, the ro robotics, I mean the uh, drone maker, um, they don't put Chinese on their business card because they don't want to be huawei -ed. They're basically, um, you know, they're inventing in China, but their, their market is the globe. It's got nothing to really do with China, and that's where it happens to be. Um, so anyhow, 
with that, I know you used to represent Shenzhen throughout the years, and now you're on the financial side, and we've got people going out. I want you to talk about the big picture of Chinese outbound investment, where you see th things working, and where the problems are. Well, thank you. Uh, since you mentioned about Shenzhen, uh, even though I, I don't uh, work for Shenzhen anymore, but I just say a few words about Shenzhen. Um, you know, as you mentioned, that uh, Shenzhen now is China's uh, innovation center. Uh, with a lot of uh, Chinese uh, uh, homegrown uh, brands. Uh, you're talking about DJI, you're talking about Huawei, you're talking about uh, Ping An Insurance, China Merchant Bank, uh, um, uh, Tencent, uh, which everybody now in China using uh, WeChat. Uh, uh, so that's been uh, very successful. So uh, uh, we're talking about China among the major cities, Beijing, basically is our political center, as well as, as the home of most of the state-owned enterprises. We're talking about Shanghai. Nowadays, if you go to Shanghai, everybody speak, speaking English because it's the home of the multinational companies. But for Shenzhen, it's the home of the Chinese homegrown uh, enterprises and brands. So I, I guess I'm very proud of uh, being, you know, um, you know uh, working uh, with Shenzhen before. And uh, now I'm on the other side of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Pacific and working uh, in the financial industry, I'm dealing basically uh, every day with the outbound uh, Chinese in, uh, investments. Um, overall, I think uh, Chinese uh, outbound investment to overseas has been growing very rapidly in the in the past years. Uh, especially, uh, you know, one of their favorite uh, destinations is, of course, is the United States. Uh, according to a uh, joint study by uh, National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and uh, a firm called uh, Rodian Group, um, by the end of 2015, in the in the, uh, in the year of 2015, there is total uh, 15 billion U.S. dollars um, uh, FDI foreign direct investment from China to the U.S. Uh, we're that's only talking about the corporate side. It's not include um, uh, Chinese people are buying houses here. Uh, if you are in St. Gabriel Valley here in Los Angeles, if you are in San Francisco, in uh, Palo Alto, if you are in New York, in uh, Queens, you will see a lot of Chinese individuals are buying houses actually drove the, uh, the house prices um, 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 unbelievable. So um, I'm not talking about the EB-5 people are, uh, Chinese people are migrating from uh, China to U.S. by using this EB-5 uh, investor uh, visa program, I'm talking about only the corporate side. Um, and also the report um, anticipate that in the year 2016 this year, and this number will double. So we'll see about 30 billion U.S. dollar uh, corporate side foreign direct investment from China to the U.S. Um, among these, I think, uh, you know, people may ask, I, you know, I want to thank um, Ambassador for this WTO. I guess uh, WTO helps a lot, of course, first of all, for um, introduce the multinational companies to China and, and help Chinese companies grow. And also with WTO that allow Chinese companies to come to the, the, the global stage and, and as, a, as a player. So um, the driver back there for um, Chinese uh, companies to uh, make overseas investment, I guess, uh, first of all, um, as Arthur mentioned earlier, uh, because now uh, in the past years we're seeing uh, China have uh, the growth of uh, over 10% out loud, we're seeing a major slowdown. We're talking about 6.5, 6.7% of growth. So with that slowdown, the return on investment there in China is uh, uh, dramatically, you know, uh, uh, small, smaller. Uh, we're talking about in real estate in China, five years ago, their return on investment in real estate is more than 30 or even 40%, with 50% 50, 50 return on investment. But now with the slowdown, especially the real estate uh, market slowdown, maybe only 10, 15%. It's relatively here we can, with the U.S. economy recover, uh, recovering where we can get here even uh, the the par return or even high return in the U.S. because we're more transparent. There is not too many hidden costs there uh, comparing there uh, in China. Let me let me ask a follow up to you mm -hmm. because you know the China's now got the deep pockets. You know, good on China. People worked hard and there's a lot of capital saved up to go out with. Um, we have. 
And we now have companies in China going out and buying companies outside that they got rich because they had a protected market in some cases. I mean, look at Anbang Insurance. That's a big pile of money masquerading as an insurance company. And they are going around and buying insurance companies around the world. They tried hotels and some others. Um, meanwhile, I watched the foreign insurance industry come into China, train the entire industry, goodwill, all of this, and they've got, what, 3% market share? They've basically been regulated out of existence. Um, you now have, uh, you know, you got Medea buying KUKA, which is uh, the, the robotics maker. Um, in Germany, and I think we're going we're, we're starting to see pushback, and we're starting. It's not so CFIUS oriented as it is just if, why should China be able to buy these companies overseas when they're blocking those industries domestically? Are you feeling that, or do you agree with me, or disagree with me? I'd like to hear your perspective. Um, I don't. As, as a matter of fact, um, I think, um, um, of course. Like you know, I'm 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 uh, uh, I'm a banker, and my bank we actually have a, a subsidiary branch there, a subsidiary uh, bank there in China, where one of the three uh, U.S. commercial banks has a full uh, banking license there in China. I'm using banking as a as an example. Uh, you're right. Um, China has opened the door for foreign banks to enter Chinese market for almost 25 years. But nowadays, if you look at market share of the foreign banks, market share is actually less than 2%. It's actually shrinking in the past years. The, shrink, um, the reason um, underlying there is not because of Chinese government not allow foreign banks to uh, get into different uh, license or, or sector of industry. It's not because of that. I guess because, number one, um, the same as the, the, the insurance industry you mentioned is Chinese local banks um, and also local insurance company, they grow in too fast. Um, I guess there is a, there is a um, um, of course, one thing with Chinese uh, fast growth in the past 20 some years, the, the fast growth of the industries is good, but on the other side, um, here in the banking industry, we're talking about if uh, the asset growth of a bank is more than 10%, there, absolutely there is a risk. So we're talking about the regulators in China, they may have some problems. Uh, they have some problems to control the risk of the growth of the industry, uh, talking about the bank industry, talking about uh, local bank industry and local insurance company. So Anbang is a very good ex example. I guess nowadays the Chinese regulators are very carefully look at their strategy of their global uh, uh, acquisition strategy because uh, they may not using their uh, premium funds uh, properly to allocate their assets. So I guess that's part of the reason uh, is Chinese uh, banking industry, insurance industry, they open, uh, they're open enough, but uh, with the local regulatory issue, uh, they uh, are too loose to manage, to, to monitor the local uh, industry growth. Do you, have, do you have, let me get the second part, do you have worries about um, pushback now on Chinese investment going out that it might start being rejected? You know, you've heard the American political debate on this. And I'm not talking security and CFIUS, I'm talking about economic fairness. Um, I don't think so. I think, you know, uh, U.S. government um, and also the other countries' government will be more open to uh, Chinese investment. That's what we're seeing every day. Uh, I know that the U.S. government, the Congress, and Chinese government are talking about the bilateral uh, investment treaty. Uh, it's almost there, and there are uh, uh, the negative uh, uh, list that they're talking about, the negative list. And so I guess once that uh, BIT, uh, bilateral investment treaty between U.S. and China, will be uh, 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 signed, and we'll see an even uh, bigger wave of Chinese investment to the U.S. Actually, it's interesting that, um, I'm going to move on to Charlene here, but it's interesting that the BIT actually is better for the U.S. than China. Um, but she is pushing it, uh, because the U.S. is already open. And the BIT will open up China more. So I'm not sure the politics behind that. Charlene, um, we're on to trade agreements here. TPP, we've had our negotiators for several years going over very strong discussions. And I'm sure all these countries had a lot of painful gives in order to get the TPP agreement. And now in this circus of our presidential election, even Hillary, who obviously supports TPP in her heart, has to be against it. 
why would, you know, what do you think about this and why the hell should anybody in Asia trust the U.S.? I think this is a significant problem. Um, the importance of TPP uh, is several fold. One is obviously the US Asia pivot, an unfortunate word. Um, but in intent, right, which is to say the US balancing more of its resources, including diplomatic resources, toward Asia than it had previously. Um, that's one aspect, and the importance of it, of course, is that the U.S. has acted as a force for stability in Asia, generally speaking, uh, and that with China's reemergence and with U.S. strategic interests in China, of course, and in shipping lanes, uh, it's important that the U.S. retain that role, not be pushed out of Asia. So the pivot's extremely important. The only non-military manifestation of the pivot that is significant is TPP. There isn't anything else. And the administration has made that quite clear and has made TPP its centerpiece for the non-military aspects of the pivot to Asia. Uh, so in the presidential campaign, because this is a populist kind of campaign, as you can see, uh, trade is not a popular issue, and everybody turns against uh, TPP. Uh, uh, and that's because, of course, the f first rule of politics is get elected. And nothing trumps uh, getting elected. That uh, word's kind of ruined now, isn't it? And so it certainly is. Uh, and so, um, so why is TPP especially important in the context of this panel? Because... The WTO agreement itself is 22 years old. It's an old agreement. It was done in 1994. Yes, there have been some subsequent agreements in telecom financial services, but even those agreements are old now. The global economy has shifted so radically in the past 20 years that the WTO itself doesn't sufficiently address the direction in which, among other things, China is going. So you'd have to cobble together bits and pieces of rules to try and get at what has become a series of systemic problems with respect to China's uh, trade and economic regime. TPP addressed those systemic issues across the broad swath of new economy issues, new economy issues, not old economy issues. That's really what, for me, makes TPP so important, not only with respect to uh, significantly augmenting the WTO and hopefully bringing all of those new economy rules back to the global trading system, but also helps to shape China's reform agenda moving forward. So in that connection, if TPP passes, super great, wonderful. If it doesn't, even if it doesn't, the next administration ought to take it in hand, sit down with the Chinese and say, you know your internal reform process needs to continue. You're behind, you're way behind, you're 13, Plenum, um, your third plenum report, you're way behind the fourth plenum, you're, you are just behind, you're behind the 2030 goals, you need to start moving forward. And by the way, this is where the rest of Asia is willing to go. Here in TPP is where the rest of your major trading partners are willing to go. It's where you should go to. Actually, if and you, you China, China's China going to respond to incentives and competition much more than somebody lecturing them. Correct. So if TPP is, 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 is opening things up for others, it will help the forces I, within the Chinese I, government I, on reform. And my only point is, whether or not it passes, the U.S. needs to use what had been agreed as a basis for trying once again to assist in shaping China's reform process. All right, I'm gonna ask Arthur a question here. Um, he's been getting off pretty easy. 
And um, I'll ask him a question, and then we'll have time for a couple from the audience. So um, is China um, going to, you know, all this debt, all of the, all, all these distortions that are not being addressed, is, is China going to, like, uh, fall to pieces in a few years? Um, if not, what's going to, uh, you know, what is the outlook for the next five years to ten years? Yeah, well, I, uh, I gave people a couple of scenarios to, to pick from last night, so I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on those. I think the short answer is no. I mean, I think it would be very foolish, particularly from the standpoint of a, a policy perspective in the U.S., to, to base policy on the assumption that something really bad is going to happen in China over the next uh, few years. I think the baseline assumption should be that China will continue to grow quite substantially over the next decade, and, and this will translate into... Uh, you know, greater assertiveness, uh, both in economic and geopolitical policy by the Chinese government. So, um, uh, yeah, there's some debt issues. Uh, I'm not terribly concerned about a financial crisis because there's no foreign uh, funding of that debt. And uh, the domestic funding of the debt still comes almost entirely from bank deposits. So we don't have the kind of uh, financial fragility that we saw either in the United States in 2008 uh, because of uh, our overly complex financial structure, or the way you have in a typical emerging market situation where there's a lot of reliance on foreign funding. So um, I don't think that it's super healthy in the long run, but uh, I think it is certainly uh, quite possible for China to continue uh, increasing its debt ratios without um, uh, sparking any kind of a major financial issue. I think the other thing that we have to recognize is that uh, we have a very, very, very powerful consumer economy that is taking off in China today. There's 80 million households in China, that's about uh, 250 million people, uh, that have a household income of $20,000 a year or more. This is where you start to buy modern services, outbound tourism, uh, higher-end consumer products, and so forth. Um, this is a, a, a true uh, middle-class uh, measure, I would say. Um, so we have 80 million of those households today. A decade from now, even under a very, very conservative growth uh, scenario for the economy, uh, that number is going to be at least a double, 160 million. So you're talking about 500 million people uh, or, or possibly even more than that. So uh, even if there are problems with the uh, Chinese government executing on all of its grand plans for industrial policy, uh, the power of the consumer economy, I think, will continue to drive things forward and, and make... Uh, China uh, a pretty substantive economic force for quite a while to come. Thank you. All right, we got time for a couple quick questions. Um, raise your hand. We got a microphone in the back there. Clayton. Hi, thank you. Uh, wonderful panel as always. And Jim, my question for the four of you stems partly from our conversation yesterday. And the question is, why the paranoia? Why the paranoia on the part of the party that drives Xi's concern with control? Uh, Andrew hints at some of it because he's absolutely right. $15 billion in corporate investment last year, twice that in terms of individuals buying homes. So that outflow of capital, the diversification, getting your kids into American education, all that sort of thing. So we see all of that. And where is the faith in growth? Where is the faith in openness producing a more sustainable economy that would, in theory, secure communist control, that would put away the fears? So where is this paranoia coming from? We hear from an authoritative source one day in the, in the People's Daily. We hear from a let's continue the leveraging the next day. What's the source of these worries? I'll give my quick political answer. I just think the Communist Party is um, a very insecure. Uh, if the party could say, look, look at all the good things we've done. We screwed up for a while. Let's move beyond it. But instead, they have to try to bury their past um, she is trying to connect the past uh, to the Deng Xiaoping era. They had rejected the past and just uh, did Deng. I think it's just a basic paranoia and insecurity of the party in the psychological makeup, makeup of the party as an entity. And now, you know, we're, we're now pushing a, uh, we're pushing a, an ideological agenda that expired 30 years ago. It's like the Pope trying to make people speak Latin again. But we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, paranoia in the Communist Party goes back to 1921, and not much has changed uh, since then. 
Um, I, I think the other things that have accentuated uh, it uh, recently are uh, the um, the color revolutions, the uh, Arab Spring, and all of those uh, things. I think have directly fed into a sense that. Um, uh, there are forces out there that would conspire to, to disrupt the system, and I think I think as the polls that um, were shown uh, from the Pew Center recently indicate that there's a, a widespread view not only within the party but within sort of the broader uh, Chinese urban uh, population that uh, there is an issue now that fundamentally the U.S. does not want China to expand and is trying to keep it down. So uh, I think this notion, this kind of conspiracy. Uh, oriented thinking is something that not ex exists not only within the uh, the party itself, but it's a little bit broader. Um, my guess is, um, you know, because China is a, a one-party uh, uh, system, so uh, it's very much it depends on uh, the leader himself or herself. Uh, with uh, Xi, I guess, um, you know, his limitation is he has very limited exposure to the global um, um, economy, global stage, and he has um, uh, even his uh, root back there is not very profound, like you know Deng Xiaoping or even Jiang Zemin. Or um, uh, so um, I agree, very insecure and very limited uh, in terms of this uh, exposure, especially exposure to the international. Uh, uh, stage so that um, actually makes him feel insecure and try to control. Uh, that's his first priority. I would say, uh, first of all, the corruption was evident to the population. I mean, it, it completely uh, open, open corruption at the local level. Uh, that's one aspect. Second aspect of paranoia is social media and the internet. Uh, you've six million college grads a year. Uh, these people have been promised the moon and the stars. There's only one of them in every family. Uh, and I think there's a lot of paranoia about that generation. Uh, and so exertion of control becomes ever more important. I think there's another aspect too, which is strict discipline helps to mobilize a nation. And if Xi Jinping wants to capitalize on the notion of a China dream, the reemergence and reassertion of China as the pole star, certainly in the heartland and uh, very much potentially beyond. He needs the nation with one vision, one vision, and that starts with the party and absolute fealty to that vision. Uh, so I think it's all of these reasons plus all of the various others that have, uh, that have already been stated. One more quick question. We just got a couple of minutes right here. Yeah, but shouldn't every country in the world be paranoid about what the United States is going to do next? We've attacked, what, 200 countries in the last couple hundred years? We have a, a, a presidential candidates that run around talking about carpet bombing and torturing and, and uh, how bad China is. We blame others for all, everything that happens here. It's very disturbing to me to see uh, forums like this that uh, that blame uh, that blame China. China has a huge American influence. Uh, we don't even let them buy a Union 76 gas station. We don't let Huawei come in and and provide uh, uh, technology. We, we uh, look at what happened with the rail. They they, they stole the the high speed rail. They stole the money from China and then and then uh, uh, blame China. I mean, it's, it's uh, everywhere you look. You have a look, question? Yeah. How, how, can you ha how can you keep blaming China for everything? China's never massacred uh, Americans in China. I mean, we've done that here in the United States. There's tremendous prejudice. There's tremendous uh, uh, keeping out barriers uh, uh, constructed against China here. And you're talking about blaming China. <laughs> Oh, well, um, could, I think I? Charlene's ready for this one. Yeah, I, you know, I, was, I don't, it, with all respect, I, I don't think anyone is blaming China. I think we're all trying to understand the direction in which China is moving and how that direction might impact the interests of American companies and the United States um, more broadly. Um, there's no question China has done a lot of things right. There's, there's no question about that. 
There's no question that the United States has helped to integrate China into the global community. Had the U.S. not supported WTO, had it not negotiated that deal, there's no other country in the world that would have done it. So I think the U.S. has also assisted in China's reemergence, and I think from the U.S. policy point of view, that reemergence is very important because a poor China could well disintegrate and entirely destabilize the region. So from the U.S. policy point of view, China's growth, the emergence of a middle class, all of these things are good. It's never been U.S. policy that poor countries should remain poor. Uh, okay. let, me, let me add just one. Yeah, I was please. born and uh, was born and raised in China. I worked for Chinese government for twenty some years, and uh, I guess um, uh, you're right. We're not blamed for China. I guess we try to encourage China to be more open to the international world and to be more uh, responsible, sophisticated, to be an international player. I guess that's something we're talking about. Try to encourage China to be more um, uh, responsible. Yeah. So um, anyhow, thanks for that. Um, I think it's a, it's a decent perspective in that, look, the U.S. is a marketplace of ideas. We've got platoons of idiots and, and um, lots going on, and many of them are running for office this year. Um, um, the, you, you, I live in China, and I've watched China. China now blames every problem it has on foreigners, and this has been ratcheted up. And so these Pew numbers reflect propaganda that's been barraged out to the Chinese people. But I can tell you, the rich people of China, the, uh, the top performers in universities, they're coming here. They recognize the U.S. has got its problems, but it's got its strengths too, and both countries do. And I think all of us want both countries just to come together. They have different ideological and political DNA, and that gets in the way. So anyhow, this has been the first panel. Uh, Terry's going to throw us off the stage soon. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>